from this subject the disciplined believer the disciplined believer father bless us tonight as we teach on discipline in Jesus name amen and uh, uh, this is a good subject leading to our upcoming shut in and it's a good subject for the times in which we live today because if there's anything uh, that we see uh, that we need to see more of in the body of Christ, in my opinion, is that we need to see more discipline. More discipline. More discipline. Many uh, in the world today are undisciplined, uh, uncontrolled. There are many in the church. It seems like to be, uh, to me, disorder seems to be the way of the world. But it takes discipline to be a successful believer. You cannot live the Christian life. You cannot wage the Christian warfare without being a disciplined person. If you are not disciplined, if you're all over the place, if you live a life that um, uh, is devoid of schedules and, and, um, and um, if you're not regimented, then I, I want you to really key in on this because uh, the believer must be disciplined. And by discipline, uh, I mean training that develops self-control, character, orderliness, efficiency, discipline, a system of rules. We've seen of late where people who were not qualified to make the rules try to make the rules. Uh, set the rules for our church, who can sing and who can't and who we should allow and who we shouldn't allow. And people who are not in a position to make the rules have tried to set the rules. But discipline is a set of rules. And discipline is also, I love this, training that develops self-control. You don't want to be married to a person who lacks self-control. It manifests in everything. Um, it manifests in their spending habits. If you lack self-control, you're dead in the water. You're DOA. Your bill, bills are always going to be out of whack. You're going to go through all kinds of challenges because you lack self-control. Uh, merchants depend on, marketers depend on people who lack self-control. They do a good job uh, your, 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 uh, your smartphone does a good job in creating a market for itself. They study, study you now and study your buying habits. And as soon as they figure out what it is you want, or, and some argue that they're listening, and as soon as you state what you want, the next thing you know, it pops up on your phone. The thing's on sale somewhere. And there you go, participating. Amen. The devil has figured out how to alter your, our, our behavior, alter our habits. Amen. Self-control. You got to be able to, uh, to walk in it. You got to be able to listen to this. Um, uh, uh, discipline yourself where you are not dominated by pleasures. Some of us will never win because our God is pleasure. And for some things, to accomplish some things, you got to defer gratification. You got to either cancel certain pleasures or put pleasures off to, a, to achieve something that is, of, that is your goal. Amen. You, you can't lose weight and you won't even change your eating habits. So I'm just praying about it. Pray all you want. You'll end up larger as a result of that because that's not the way you accomplish that. Certain things have to happen. Amen. So I want to talk tonight about uh, being disciplined. Now, um, before we go into this, 
uh, Paul, before Paul deals with verse 24 through 27, Paul described something that he did and something that he, that he did in his life that required enormous discipline. Enormous discipline to, to, to pull it off because without discipline, he would have never been able to do the things that he described that he did in order to win some. It takes discipline to win souls. It takes discipline to um, promote the church. It takes discipline for everything. Discipline on your job. It takes discipline. Everybody say discipline. So now I, I want to show you something that Paul, that Paul did that, that is remarkable. Let's go back to, in the same chapter 9, let's back up to verse um, 20. Because he tells us in verse 16 that, that he has to preach the gospel. He says a dispensation of the gospel is laid upon him. In fact, he says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Am I right? Says verse 17, for if I do this willingly, willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, even if I don't feel like it, a dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. He says, whether I feel like it or not, I still have to do this. It is what the Lord has committed to me. Then he says, so what then? What is my reward then? What is my pay? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I, I may make the gospel without charge that I, should, um, that I should not abuse my power in the gospel. The point he was making here is he had to make sure he did everything that was necessary so that no one would be able to bribe him or to move him one way or the other when it came to delivering the word of the Lord. He said to the saints at Corinth, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to do you service because not only were they uh, stingy and didn't want to support him, but those who did want to support, they wanted to... Uh, influence him also. And see, this is one thing that you have to warn church leaders with. Never use your uh, contribution, whether it's financial, whether it's your intelligence, whether it's your know-how, or whatever. You can't use that to try and influence the direction of the church. You can't do that. Well I, well, I know pastor will do this because I want him to do it, and I hold this position, or I hold that position. You can't do that. That's the devil. See, can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm paused right there. Not that I'm having this problem, but let me just park it there because you got quiet. You, you, can't, you can't do that. It, you, no matter how, uh, no matter what your contribution is, you can't, you can't, the, when you try that stuff, you, you, if, if the pastor is strong, you learn that you're flexing muscles that you do not have. Well, I, I won't give. Then, then you, you, you quickly learn that it is God who prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Says, well, I'm not going to come back to church. You find out that a whole lot of folk have done that, and the church still marches on. So what Paul did, he didn't want the Gentiles to be able to control him with their contributions. So he, when he preached to the saints at Corinth, he didn't take it. He didn't take a dime from them. The point was, he wanted to be able to preach the gospel freely. Think of the number of preachers today. And I've had them meet with me and tell me, Reverend, I, I believe like you believe, but if I, if I said those things, I'd lose my job. I said, brother, you ought to lose your job then. And you don't know it, you've already lost it because your job is actually preaching God's truth. Now, if you let a deacon or a system, people say, you know, there's no differences in denominations, one church is as good as another. People who say that aren't in ministry. So you hear that kind of stuff from the pews. You don't hear that from the pulpit because the pulpit know that there are day and night differences. They are, they're as different as day and night. Most mainline denominations, 
I could not fit in. They would fire me for preaching the truth. I wouldn't last a month uh, as a, uh, a Methodist preacher, United Methodist. Most of them now have adopted. They, they, they're struggling to keep same-sex marriage out. You know good and well somebody preached like I do. My job is gone. After one Sunday, they said, we can't have it. An organization where they have deacons who smoke and drink and all that stuff. I wouldn't last a day. First deacons meeting. You find. First conference, I'm out of a job. You, you, you couldn't last. That's one of the reasons why I praise the Lord for the church of God in Christ. You, you have the latitude to preach God's truth. Not every Kojic preacher preaches God's truth, but every Kojic preacher can. So for those of you who don't, shame on you. Because you, 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 you know you ought to because you're in an organization where you're not penalized if you do. Now, for those who are in organizations and you're penalized for doing it, you should leave those organizations. Because when you stand before God, the Lord's going to judge us on whether or not we preach the gospel. Amen. So Paul preached to them. And then he goes on. He says in verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. Now, what did Paul mean when he said this? Now, let me tell you what he couldn't mean. He could not mean that he put, placed himself back under the law of Moses. Couldn't have meant that. It couldn't have meant that he went back to being a Pharisee. Because remember, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He renounced all of that. He, he considered all that as dumb. So it couldn't have meant that in, in, in order to reach some of the Jews, he went back to being the Jew that he was before he met Jesus. The Jews, Paul, before he met Jesus, he served the Lord through the law, the law of Moses, and the law, the thing about the law, the strength of the law was it showed men their errors. The weakness of the law is, is that it did not offer deliverance from the error. That's why they had to keep sacrificing bulls and goats and rams and, and you had to have all the turtle doves and stuff like that. The, the law could not affect the conscience of a man. Hallelujah. When Jesus died and rose again, Jesus gave us something that would change a man from the inside out. No one, you couldn't get born again in the sense that Jesus described the new birth through the law of Moses. There's no law that gives you steps to being born again. Born again was a part of the New Testament, the new agreement that God made that Jesus brought. Part of the new meal. He says, after eating that, that last Passover meal, he says, all right, that's the end of that. I, I, I got a new meal for you. This is my body, which is broken for you. And this is my blood that's shed for you. You see? So now, uh, uh, Paul, when he met Jesus, Jesus, Jesus changed him from the inside. And he learned that, that you get saved through faith. And it's by grace and through faith and not by just keeping all of the ceremonial tenets of the law. The spirit of the law was, to, was, was yet in place and what all of the ceremonies led to. But all of those things, you, he learned that you could serve God without having to walk under that weight and also that because one had been saved by grace, being saved by grace, causes a person not to want to sin up a storm, but to want to serve the Lord who saved them by grace. See, the thing about being saved by grace, when you realize how wonderful salvation is, it changes your appetite. It causes you to not want to do those things. See, salvation by grace, a person really hadn't been saved when they could sin up a storm, drink up a storm, lie up a storm, fornicate up a storm, do all these things up a storm and just say, hey man, God's a forgiving God. Well, you know the problem with that person is they've never met the Lord. Because when you meet the Lord, you want to please the Lord. 
you want to do those things that he's called us to do because we are, we are new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So Paul wasn't saying here that he want that, that, that to win the Jews, he became a Jew. Now, what may help you see the skill and the discipline here is the way Paul dealt with Timothy and Titus when it came to circumcision. Let's look at it. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. I'm going to show you something. <clears throat> We're talking about discipline now. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul says, verse 1, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem. You see it? With Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Titus was the young understudy. Newly saved, and Titus was a Gentile. All right, probably a Greek uh, from probably from Macedonia. All right, so Titus is with uh, the Jew Paul and the Jew Barnabas, and uh, uh, they are in Jerusalem, in the home of the Jews. Titus is born again, serving the Lord. As a spirit-filled Gentile servant, a young understudy of the apostle, and here they are in the headquarters uh, of Judaism, uh, where the temple once were, stood, this is before the temple was destroyed, and so here they are, and Paul is there with Titus. Are you with me? And he says, and I went up by revelation and communicated with them that, and communicated with them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them. Now what occasioned this meeting, what caused Paul to go up there, and saints, you know, this the word of the Lord is, is, is just, just good, isn't it? In uh, Acts chapter 15, a problem broke out. The Bible says in verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except, now notice who he taught. He taught the brethren. The brethren here were the Gentile believers. And these were believers in Antioch, Syria. They were not Jews. They had never, these believers had never been taught the law of Moses. They never been taught uh, the, the law of the Jews, all right? These people were saved and serving Jesus Christ. Paul had preached them out of their sins and having good Holy Ghost Field Church. All right. So now from Jerusalem, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from headquarters, these uh, missionaries were sent. And they said to the saints, they said, and except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. You cannot be saved. Now, let me say this to you. Had they come and just been preaching uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the benefits of circumcision, that circumcision is a good idea, that there's, there's nothing wrong with being circumcised, let us explain circumcision to you, Paul probably wouldn't have had a problem with them. The problem came in is that they made it a requirement for salvation. That was the problem. Because you can't add on to requirements for salvation. 
Well, what does it require to be saved? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and stop wearing a certain article of clothing, clothing and wear another article. It is not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and stop wearing your hair a certain kind of way. To be saved is to believe on what Jesus did on the cross. Period. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, after you get saved, we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That growth process that deals with what we wear, how we act, what we do, how we behave is called sanctification. But sanctification doesn't save you. Matter of fact, it is not sanctification. You can't call it sanctification until you get saved for it to qualify. Because there are some people who are not saved, who've never met Jesus, and yet they have never committed any of the acts that some who have met Jesus had to get sanctified from. So those people, even though they've never drank, never smoked, never did drugs, they don't, have to get, they don't have to be sanctified from that because they've never done it. But because they don't know Jesus, they're still not sanctified. You can only become sanctified after you get saved. Until you get saved, whether you have bad habits or not, you're on your way to hell. The, the morally good person is as hell bound as the serial killer. Praise the Lord. The kind, gentle, sweet, loving individual is as lost as the racist. Do you follow me? So the problem came in here is that he told them that they, they said you cannot be saved. Now when they said that, they were up preaching. The Bible says, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension <laughs> and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question and being brought on their way by the church. The saints paid their expense. They passed through uh, Phoenicia, Phoenicia, and it tells you they went through Samaria and they're declaring the conversion of the Gentile. Now, the, po the point I'm making is they had to take this uh, question to headquarters which uh, goes a long way toward the doctrine of organized religion. Amen. So when you're in a church and the pastor is it, and there's no hierarchy, I just pray that he don't go off. Because there's no checks and balances. Amen. So now, so now we're back in Galatians. I'm talking about being disciplined. Amen. So he says here, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. See? I, lest the, 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 the problem at the Antioch church would not have been solved. It was so important that we solve this because if you study it, you'll see that Paul grew quite belligerent. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so heated. One writer said that, that they never let those guys finish their sentence. Once they added something to salvation, they treated them like they were heretics. And it was a bad, a bad, it was a bad falling out at the church at Antioch. And they said, well, we got to take this to, to Jerusalem. We said, we, we, Paul said, we certainly shall. And they went to Jerusalem. 
So now going to Jerusalem now to solve this problem. Remember, the problem is, except uh, you are circumcised, according to Moses, you cannot be saved. And the point I'm trying to show you is, when Paul said, when I was of the Jews, I became as the Jews, he didn't go back under Jewish law like that. Because we see him fighting it right here. So he says, that those who are of reputation, I saw privately. Now look at this, verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, that is, he was a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. He said, Titus, come with us. And I don't care what they say. You're not going to be circumcised. Look at, look at this man of God talking about discipline, standing his ground, standing his ground to make this point. See, <clears throat> we're used to, not, not here, but in the church world today, we're used to preachers who are, who are marshmallows. You softies, you cave, you fold like a cheap tent. You, so people, people are accustomed to preachers who are standing their ground. Or you see these guys, they argue for wrong. With, with venom. When preaching the other day, arguing so that, that, that to prove that he drank just as much as the slain rapper drank. They say, well, he cussed. And the preacher said, well, I cussed. I said, well, you can't. I shouldn't say anything about the rapper because uh, he drank. Well, I drank a little Hennessy or whatever he said every now and again. Now, what kind of preacher would do that? And what was worse is the response of the people. I would like to think that if I got up and told you that I drank, you'd leave. I would like to think that you say, well, before you leave, try to pray for me. Pray that I get delivered. Now, you know, my job, <laughs> job as pastor is pretty much gone, you know. <laughs> but yeah, at least pray for my soul. And, uh, and then I get up and tell you that I cuss just like the rapper cuss. Well, what kind of pastor does things like that? This, this whole thing is mixed up. See, no discipline. No discipline. People are undisciplined. They'll say amen to anything. So he says to, to Titus, he says, but um, neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because, look at this, and that because of false brethren. The false brethren are the ones he's referring to who came from Jerusalem up to Antioch. He says, false brethren, unawares, brought in. He said, I had no idea those men were going to get up and say that. Who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring, that they may bring us into bondage. They tried to bring us right back in under the law. So now he fights not to go back under the law. Well, you know then he wouldn't fight this fiercely not to go back under the law and then turn around and say, well, to win some Jews, I went back under the law. That wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make, that would be highly inconsistent. It's, look at this. It says, to whom, look at this, verse 5, I really like this one. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not one hour. Other words, Paul said, we did not budge an inch. Wouldn't take down. We stood on, this man is not going to be circumcised. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You cannot add anything to salvation but believing on Jesus Christ. He says that the truth of the gospel may continue with you. He says we did not budge. And listen, saints, they did, he did not. So it took discipline for him to stand. But then, then notice in Acts chapter 16, when dealing with Timothy, Acts 16, and dealing with Timothy, he says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there. 
this is a believer, named Timothy, uh, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess. She was Jew and believed, but his father was a Greek. He was part Jew, part Gentile. All right? You see that? He was a believer. His mother was a believer. And either his father died or his father tolerated, was highly tolerant of his mother serving Jesus. And, uh, and it didn't bother the family. Which was well reported of by the brethren which were at Lystra and Iconium. So, uh, Timothy had a good reputation. He came, from, he came from a good family. He saved. Look at this. Him would Paul have to go forth with him. And look at this. And took and circumcised him. Because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now, notice this. Two men and two different methods. He circumcised Timothy, but he wouldn't circumcise Titus. The reason he circumcised Timothy was that the circumcision was not attached to salvation but it was used as a stratagem to help uh, the Jews whom they would minister to be more open to hearing the gospel see but with Titus they said hey you can't be saved unless you're circumcised Paul says I'm not going to do it so what is what is the take home here what Paul did is he was smart both moves were smart and it required discipline. The Jews here, when, when, when Paul spoke of the Jews, he was talking of referring to their national customs, their essential matters, their traditions. And Paul knew that he could not subject Titus to that. So he stood his ground so as not to violate the doctrine of Christ. So Paul would actually go in and work with the Jews, and he would go as far as he could in trying to win them without violating the teachings of Christ. So he did not just become a Jew, as in going back into the phylacteries, going back into being a full-fledged Pharisee. He didn't go and rejoin the Sanhedrin. He worked with their national customs. He dealt he, he adjusted to their non-essentials and their traditions. It's just like us in the world. You got to know how. To, you got to know how to get along in the world. You can't be so saved that people can't work with you. People can't laugh with you. People can't talk with you. you you're so saved that you're at the ball game and you're just so vexed because you looked over there and that set somebody drinking a beer at the game. So you can't get in the game because there's a sinner over there drinking the beer. Well, you, you're going to do more harm. It's, it's, it's like believers uh, back in the day, the saints, when they would go to the beach, they would be at the beach with dresses on. I mean, it's better. Just if, if, if your conviction is that strong, just don't go. Or you out jogging. You know, you're jogging on the track where people jog, but you're dry, jogging in a dress because in your, in your church they preach, they preach against wearing pants. Well, you actually did more damage to the cause of Christ. You actually, you actually discourage people from joining the church because they looked and said, who's that fool? There you go. Missionary so-and-so in the dress just. That, that doesn't, that is not appealing. Say, so, well, that honored God. How? Because one thing, the one thing that honored the Lord, what Paul is talking about now, he's talking about stratagems that we adopt that helps us win souls. I'll never forget, I was at a Kojic, one of our conferences, and this conference was in Atlanta. I got up early that morning, went down for breakfast, and I just sat there, uh, in the uh, lobby area, area where they were serving food, 
and uh, just, uh, yeah, I love to observe people. And, and the saints were there, and, and people were there who were there working, and they were in business attire. And one lady came down, and uh, it's a white lady, and uh, she had on a, 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 a business suit, a jacket, slacks, business suit. She wasn't with our group, and, uh, but she was there for business. And, uh, and I saw one of our wonderful uh, church mothers, uh, missionaries, a whole bunch of them, uh, they were there. And that, that morning, I saw the saints as the saints greeted each other. And I couldn't help but notice that when she walked up to them, she said, well, good morning. And they said, hey. And when I got their food, you know why? Because she had on pants. And she wasn't one of them. And she wasn't a member of the church. Now, the, the, the lady looked at her like, what's wrong with this idiot? And I looked at her, I slid down in the chair, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let me, let me hide my badge because I'm not with this group acting like that. That's, see, you got to know how. You got to know how when you're with the Jews to, to be cordial. I, I was uh, at Hertz in St. Louis and the lady told me when I was getting my car, she said, well, Reverend, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm a Baptist. This is a sister. She said, I'm a Baptist. She said, but I'm telling you right now, if I didn't know the Lord, based on the way I've been dealing with some of y'all people, I wouldn't go to your church because they're just too mean. Oh, Pam was right there. She said that. I said, yes. I said, I've been talking about that problem for some time. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Said, You're not flirting with people to be nice. You're not being sinful to be palpable and cordial and to smile. It, it, I tell you, it does more. It does... It helps up a room if you're nice. It really does. It really, really does. Praise the Lord. Well, I didn't like what they were wearing. It still helps the cause of the church uh, to be nice. Amen. I spoke to a young man not long ago, and I, and I looked at the guy. I mean, the guy, the guy just looked like he was just all gangster uh, for real, right? And so I said, well, how are you doing, young man? And the guy said, I'm doing fine, sir. How are you today, sir? That was the look. But there was a, that, now, what would it, would it have been like had the man of God duh, <laughs> been so saved uh, that I don't have time for someone who looks like that? But he, but he walks up to the preacher and says, hello, sir. Oh, you could have bought me for a penny had that happened. Because which of the two behave more like Jesus? So let me get back to this now. I'm talking about discipline. See, well, amen. When I come in, y'all put me up because I, I, look, I come loaded. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now look at this. He says, so he says now, when I was with the Jews, that, that, the point he was making was, I went as far as I could go without compromising my walk with Christ. And then he says, notice in verse 20, he says in the second clause, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Now here, this part, he's not referring to the customs and the non-essential matters of Jewish life, but he's dealing with the actual Jewish people. So he deals with their religion, and then he deals with their, the people. Verse 20, the B clause, excuse me, to them that are under the law. He's dealing with their religious life now. I love what the believer's commentary said about this. He says, when he was with the, with the Jews, the Jewish people, Paul behaved as a Jew in matters of moral indifference. For instance, he ate the food which the Jewish people ate and refrain from eating such things as pork, which were forbidden to them. Perhaps Paul even refrained from working on the Sabbath day, realizing that if he did this, the gospel might gain a more readily hearing from the people. As a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul was not under the law as a rule of life. He merely adapted himself to the customs, habits, and prejudices of the people in order that he might win them to the Lord. 
Ryrie said this, Paul is not demonstrating two-facedness nor multi-facedness, but rather he is testifying of a constant restrictive self-discipline in order to be able to serve all sorts of men just as a narrowly channeled stream is more powerful than an unbound marsh, marshy swamp. So restricted liberty results in more powerful testimonies for Christ. He knew how to go in and out among the people and, uh, and how to touch them for Christ. Paul knew how to be a, a narrowly channeled stream which produces power, the current, a, a, a open marsh with no boundaries, nothing happens. Nothing flows, nothing happens. See, we got to know how to uh, win people, know how to be likable. I talk to you all the time about smiling. And, and some of you caught on, some of you, have de you determined you're just not going to do it. I give up on you. But the rest of us, you know, if I, if I catch you on camera and there's, there's a problem, I'm going to move you. But you don't want, you want people, and I get compliments. Do you know I get pastors and bishops to write me? They talk to me about how you look on camera. People pay attention to it. Amen. It's, uh, a bishop told me the other day, he said, I wish my, my members responded the way yours do. I wish, I wish they had the look on their faces. I said, man, thank you. I'll pass that along. I said, we work on it. Yes, Amen. 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 Because you, you, want, you, want to be, you want to be loving. You, if, if we're representing Jesus, we ought to look like we're representing Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're not rappers. We're not hip-hop artists. They refuse to smile. They, I guess they have nothing to smile about. As a saint, you have something to smile about. Praise the Lord. And, and when you feel bad, know how to... It takes discipline. It takes discipline to feel bad and act like you feel good. See, some, most people haven't reached that kind of strength yet. They don't know that there's a strength in that. Weakness is everything that bothers you, it shows. That means you're weak. The strong believer. And you're not faking it. You know, it's amazing what we call faking. Yeah, you sitting there acting like everything is all right. Well, what do you want me to do? To sit there and act like everything's all wrong? What good comes out of that? I've heard people say some of the craziest things. The husband and the wife, they argue all the way to church. Then get to church and get out the car and walk into the church and act like everything's all right. Opposed to getting out the car, walking in the church, and arguing in the church? Come on, I, I don't think some of us follow these things to their logical conclusion. It's the right thing to do. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, I don't, because nobody's come to church to hear you argue. Hey amen, you better leave it in the car. It's, hey amen, I'll give you another reason not to fight, because you can't bring that into church. No, it takes discipline to be able to shift. See, discipline in the, in, in the church world is just as strong as discipline in the world. You know, we, we, we marvel at the receiver who can, while trying to catch the ball, put his toes right on the line and catch the ball. It takes discipline and practice to do that. It takes discipline and practice to do this. To live this and to be good at it and to be successful and to make it look easy. For when somebody walk up to you and say, you, you look like you don't have any problems. That's a compliment. Because you know you got problems. Everybody has problems. Do you ever a preacher told me one time said, So you have problems like other people. I looked at him and I said, Man, problem more than most. But I just chose, I choose not to talk about that. I, when I get up to talk, when I'm, I'm in the elders' council amongst the brethren, I get up to talk, I choose to talk about what God is doing. God is moving by his spirit. That's not to say everything is going right. Sometimes in my most positive testimonies, I gave them at times when everything was just falling down. But it takes discipline to be able to push your way through that. Paul says, I'm, not only was, am I disciplined enough to deal with the individual Jew in their religious life, disciplined enough to shift and deal with them in their national life, he says, but not just the Jews, verse 21, but to them that are without the law, Gentiles, to them that are without the law. Then he says parenthetically, 
uh, uh, being not without uh, the law to God, but rather uh, the law to Christ. Paul says, now I'm not free to do anything I want to do, even though I'm not subject to the law of Moses. I am, but I am subject to the law of Christ because I'm saved by grace and grace teaches us to walk right. So he says, in dealing with uh, uh, Gentiles, he says, I really know how to win them. To, to, to deal with these people, Gentiles who've never known the law of Moses. Paul says, I will comply with their habits. I will, will, will be sensitive to their feelings. I will go as far as I can possibly go uh, in their customs and in their ways. I'll even eat some of their food. I'll do all those kinds of things. Now, as long as I hadn't been sacrificed to idols, I'll do all of that as long as I can still be loyal to my Savior. So at work, praise the Lord, on your job, in your home, in your community, go as far as you can without being disloyal to Jesus. People say that uh, you shouldn't compromise. And that is true, but if you, if, you, if you go a little deeper, compromise, you can compromise. I preached a message one time entitled, Compromising without being compromised because nobody compromised like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They compromised. They worked in Nebuchadnezzar's administration. Did they not? When he had a feast to honor his God and he invited his administration they went. Did they not? That's right. When they had the festival, they participated. Did they not? Right. You read it now. Go home and read it again tonight. They did. They were there. They participated. It was no problem until they said, now at the time that you hear the music, that's when everybody bows down and worship my God. There they said, can't do that. Can't do that. See, no, no. Now, I can participate. I can laugh. I'm a worldly person. I know how to go in and out. But now, I can't do that. And I won't do it. Everybody bowed but them. Man, boy, we're in a minority. Everybody's on their faces while the band is playing. But these three men, they said, we're not going to do it. And they didn't. And they got in trouble. And the king says, now here, I promoted you. You know you're, you know you're a minority. You're, you're a Jew, and uh, you're from a conquered land, and I've, I've, I've raised you up. Daniel spoke well of you. Now, what is this I hear? That you won't bow to my image. They say, hey, king, we're not even careful to dance you on this one. Bernard, look, look we just let, let's sell this right now. We're not going to do it. And if uh, you play that music, we're not going to do it. And our God whom we serve, he is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And king, if he don't, we still won't. There's a lot of things we can do, but we won't do that. Amen. We won't do that, king. So you might as well, you know, we're going we're gonna to cut this thing sharp. We ain't going to talk about this all day. I'm not going to do that. And the king threw them into the burning fire of furnace. The furnace burned up the men who threw them in. But when they got thrown into the furnace, the Lord Jesus was there for them. And he brought them out. So they knew how. See, the Bible is replete with people who know how. They have the discipline to walk in the world without being of the world. It takes discipline. It takes discipline. You work in a department and everybody's cussing and you're working in there. You, Lord, pastor, just pray for me because I'm scared that I might go to cussing after a while. I'm wondering why. Why? Well, they cuss all day. Okay. Understand that. But why would that affect you? It, you, it should encourage you not to. Well, I'm in, a, I'm in a department and everybody around me are homosexual and they're lesbians. And I'm, I just need prayer that the Lord cover me. For what? It's a privilege. You're the only saint in that. What are you scared of? Everybody, all the sinners on the plane talking about, keep them coming. <laughs> all the sinners want to drink. You're the only one sitting there, Lord, please, Lord, don't let this plane crash. Lord. Oh. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> what did we hit then? We hit the, hit the air pocket. Boom. Oh, God. 
the sinners in there. <laughs> Plain crash, they're going to hell. Plain crash, you're going to heaven, and you're the one who's scared to death. And, and they're looking at you, wondering what in the world. You got to know how. Now, if you're going to read your Bible, please do, because I'll read mine. But I don't be sitting there, let me find me a scripture, because... I'm scared. Oh, Lord, something may happen. Oh, no. You got to know how to sit there and have some dignity. Praise the Lord. Well, who are you and what do you do? Tell them who you are. Tell them what you do. And why are you in it? Tell them, yes, and I, I'm a born-again believer. I love Jesus Christ. Oh, you one of those Christians? Oh, yes. Well, what kind of church do you go to? Holiness? Listen, let me, let me tell you about my church. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you do that. But you don't sit there and act like you're the only, you're just scared and you can't function and all that. You got to know how to operate. Then Paul says, to the weak. Now, this is a tough one because now, I'll be honest with you, this one is hard. The weak deals with dealing with people who are over scrupulous. They are excessively sensitive about matters that were really not of fundamental importance. Now, when you're dealing with believers like that, you've met them, where everything is a sin. Everything. Everything is a sin. How many, how many pieces, kernels of popcorn have you eaten? <laughs> well, I'm on my... I wasn't counting them, but this is my third. Don't, don't sin. Don't eat too much now. You know, that stuff, you can't, you know, you can't live around people like that. Amen. Everything's a sin. Paul says, now you got to know how to deal with them because there are people like that. They're, they're just so sensitive. They can't, they can't get through a church service. They can't get through one because somebody done did something. Oh, somebody said something. And it's their job. It's their job to be convicted about it. Their job to see it. Nobody else saw it but them. And, and, and many times these overly sensitive people, they're overly sensitive, about, overly sensitive about things that have no eternal moment. They're not even heavy issues. And they tend not to have a sensitivity at all for heavy things. You get mad and won't speak to somebody for months because they didn't speak to you. You're overly sensitive on things like that. But then things that you should be convicted about, they don't bother you. Paul says, I even know how to deal with them. I started to write him a letter and say, or try to call him and say, Paul, tell me what to do. Because it's a challenge. And you know what? The church is filled with all these people. There's the Jew. There are those who are under, bond, under bondage. There are those who are overly sensitive. And you got to have the discipline. To deal with them all. You can't just say to folk, I ain't got time for you. No, no, because see, you, you never know who, may, who you may need to have time for you. Because see, the very people you write off may be the very ones that God used to pull you out. Say, so, well, I'm not, I, don't, I won't need to, I don't, I don't need to be pulled out. You don't need to be pulled out today. See. You just never know. So Paul says, I know how to deal with the, the weak. With the weak, I became as weak that I might gain the weak. And he says, and, and I am made all things to all men that I might save some. So he's talking about is winning souls. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Then he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race. My time, look at this. They which run in the stadium, in the races, in the games. And, and it's interesting that he would use the game analogy because the Corinthians in Corinth, they held uh, games uh, that were, 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 uh, were, were second only to the Olympics. So the Corinthians were very, very, very uh, knowledgeable about the, 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 uh, the Greek games and the athletic competitions. And they, they knew well when he went to this analogy about the discipline of the, the runner and how disciplined they, they were, how they trained themselves 
to, to function. Amen. And uh, 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 Paul begins and, and, and to, to put a price tag on spiritual leadership. The cost of spiritual leadership is spiritual discipline. Just bear with me. Spiritual discipline. The analogy is that of attract me. Amen. And uh, the Corinthians were aware of the strict discipline and the strenuous training. And he says that in a natural race, all of them runs, but one received the prize. But in this Christian race, all of us have the potential to be successful. But he tells us, notice what he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run. You run as though nobody, only as only one seat in heaven left. Run like that. But you can't run. You can't run. You can't run if you're not disciplined. Because you can't just start running. The runner, here's what the people understood. The runners train to run. They exercise. They worked out. It's quiet in here. They train. They deny themselves certain pleasures. They deny themselves, look at, listen to this, certain food. They denied themselves of themselves in order to get in shape so that they could contend. How much effort do you put into being a successful Christian? You save, you love the Lord. Okay, what do you do to be good at it? Next time you talk to someone, ask them that. So, what do you do to be good at it? Watch them speak in tongues. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's going to take them a minute to, to come up with something because people don't, people, what do you do to be good at it? See, because what, what, what do you do uh, to train so that you're running to, to be number one? He says, so run that you may obtain. Now, he says, now every man that striveth, some says right here, he shifted to a wrestling uh, analogy. But he says here, every man that striveth for the masteries, here it is, is temperate in all things. He's disciplined. He's disciplined. He's disciplined. A wrestler once asked his coach, can I smoke, can't I smoke, drink, and have a good time and still wrestle? Coach, the coach answered, yes, but you won't win. Yeah, you can do all that stuff, but you won't win. If you want to be good at this, to be good at serving the Lord, you got to consciously, consciously rid yourself of everything and everyone that gets in the way of that goal. You can't convince me that you're trying to give up a habit if you're hanging around people who have that habit. Well, they're all my friends. Well, if all your friends smoke, you need a new set of friends. And you're trying to quit? It's like the man, I saw a case one time where the woman's husband was an alcoholic. The man trying to get off drinking but, uh, but his wife still buy liquor, take the liquor to the house because the, the, her, their friends can hold it. They can hold the oil. He can't hold it. So he drink a little bit. Three days later, he wake up, he's still drunk. But the rest of them can drink. And, and, and obviously, he wouldn't save people. But I thought to myself, man, his chances of getting delivered would be much greater if he was just married to somebody who didn't bring liquor in the house. I said to myself, maybe you need a divorcer. Praise the Lord, but, but, but he's going to need help to stop drinking. The, 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 the disciplined believer, the disciplined believer is disciplined with what they watch on television. They're disciplined with Bible study. They're disciplined with who they hang with. People in your life, I'll imagine, are they helping you um, in your quest to serve the Lord? Or in, are they in the way? 
Are they a, a stepping stone or a stumbling block? The disciplined athlete, you know, y'all had to rid yourself. It's because you got to eat right so your body will heal. Eat right so you, you, you build muscle so you can perform. All that kind of stuff. The believer has to do the same thing. Here you go struggling with perversion. And all your friends online, all the pictures we see you posted with, you posted with homosexuals. You ain't trying to get delivered. You're trying to be slick. Praise the Lord. And then dumb enough to post it. You're not trying to be delivered. You're not trying to get out. See, how bad do you want to be who and what the Lord would have you to be? How bad do you want to win? See, only you have to answer that question for yourself. Pastor, I'm trying to get over, get over this. I keep going back to smoking because it's easy to, to do and an easy analogy. Hopefully here nobody smokes. But you ain't going to get delivered from smoking with a cigarette pack in your pocket. <laughs> Not going to happen. It's too easy, you know. As soon as a little stress comes, <laughs> you, you're not going to get delivered with one hidden at the back, in the back of the closet because you know where it is. You know where to find it. Every five minutes, you go into the bedroom, coming back smelling funny. Amen. Spraying all, <laughs> trying to clear the air. No, no, that's not the way to get delivered. You got to give it up. 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 Try have trouble with your flesh, but you watch all of the soft porn. All you got uh, uh, HBO, Cinemax, Stars, all of them, all of them, all of them, and you watch them all. Got them all DVR. Got watch them all, but you're trying to get, but you, but you struggle. You wonder why you're struggling in your flesh, and you watch them all. Good place to start would be cancel that. Well, I just, it's just such, it's such temptation. Okay, then get a new package. Get a package minus all them channels because you can get rid of them now. Nah, you can't watch them. Now, Pastor, you've gone too far. No, no, not if you, not if you want to win. See, for people who are serious about winning, the athlete who wants to win, he goes to the coach and he asks, what does it take? To get me, am I right? To get me to the next level, what must I do, coach? And the coach lays it out. You know, two minutes into a practice, you know whether you're dealing with a winner or a loser. When you, am I right? Dealing with an athlete, you know he's a real coach. You know whether or not it's, this person is not going to blossom because they ain't got it. They don't have what it takes. Physically, they're big enough. They're heavy enough, they're tall enough, but up here, a, a midget, a mental midget, a midget. When I used to play football, we'd beat them. We'd beat them the first, first few downs, you beat your opponent by hitting them hard, looking for that fear in there. I don't care if he's 6'10". If you hit him and he look at you, he looks twice, you see something, oh, I got him now because he's scared. You broke his spirit. You can't let the devil break your spirit. Let me wrap this up. Let me wrap this. Paul says this. He says, so run, run. And then he switches the metaphor. He, he switches it. He says, every man who strive for the mastery, I, I, I tell you, like, we, we, we can't get in the shut in fast enough. Every man who strive for the mastery, he says they, they're temperate, they're disciplined in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible, a corruptible crown, a wreath. But we do it an incorruptible crown. Look at all the practice and the training they put in for just a few moments of glory. Look at how much, how little practice we put in, and we want heaven and eternal glory. He says, I therefore run, not as uncertainty. See, in, in running, you got to stay in your lane or you get disqualified. You can be the fastest person in, in there, but if you drift into your opponent's lane, they would disqualify you. He says, so I run, not as a surgeon. And he says, so fight I, but not as one that beats the air. Paul says, I'm not a shadow boxer. Here's what I want to get to. Here's what is sobering. The fighting, the wrestling that Paul does, the boxing that he does, and the running that he does, 
Guess who his opponent is? It is not the devil. It is not a demon. It's him. Himself. He says, but I keep under my body. I contend with me. You got to contend with you. It's something about him that I can't stand. You got the problem. It's your carnal self. It ain't that person. I just, I can't stand them. No, no, no. It's you. See, you got to learn yourself because you're in a boxing match with yourself. Self will throw a right hook. Self will get you with a jab. Self will hit you with an uppercut. Your own self will wrestle against you. Self. Your own flesh will try to outrun you and cut you off and keep you from the path that God has for you. Self will come and cut you off and turn you in the next direction. Your own self. Paul says, I keep under myself. My body. My body. I've got to, oh God, I've got to watch me. That's a good thing to tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, watch yourself. <laughs> self, self. The husband sees the wife, the wife sees the husband, but no one sees themselves. The preacher sees the people, and the people see the preacher, but no one sees themselves. It's easy for us to look out and see what someone else did to provoke us. It's, it's popular now for, you know, the news media. They're so wicked. They're so wicked. Everything now is a trigger. So folk have figured out how to, be, to no longer be responsible for their own actions. So so-and-so, when, when, so, so, when I saw him wearing this mega hat, that triggered me. If that's true, you are a silly individual. You're weak, you're weak, you're weak. You're weak. Uh, a girl on a college campus right here in, in, in Raleigh, in New, uh, Chapel Hill, she jumps on a guy because he shows a picture of an aborted baby, and she attacked him. You know her excuse was? That picture triggered her. I hope they put her in jail. You can't, you can't do that. Uh-uh. And if, and if you're that weak, if you're that weak, you got to discipline yourself. Get that out of you. Every time I see, I watch, so I'm, I'm an observer of people. Every time I see so-and-so up, I just. <laughs> it's not that person. Mm -mm. You don't see what yourself is doing to you. Praise the Lord. Paul, Paul, notice what Paul says. He says, I didn't try, I don't keep under, under the Jews. I shift to deal with them. Gentiles, I shift who I keep under. See, it is myself. Leaders, you can't, you, you, you can't be dogmatic over the departments in the church that you reign, that you lead. You ain't no little giant. You can't build no fortress. Everybody walking here is under my rule. You come into choir rehearsal, you come into the men's meeting, you come into the youth, you come into the women's, you come, whatever. I rule, I run. No, 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 no. You got to have the discipline to shift. Because it's God's rule. Amen. It's God's church. Praise the Lord. And, 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 uh, and if we don't know how to do it, then we got to ask the Lord to discipline. I've gone too long tonight. Amen. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted to take it because he, he says, I keep under my body to bring it under subjection. Lest by any means, while I have preached to others, I myself be disqualified. He's not talking about here about being lost, even though you can be lost. He's not talking about being lost. He's talking about actually something that is that 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 occurs more often than we would like to believe. And that is this. And it's, and it's provable. See, you really can't prove who go to heaven and who doesn't. You can give your thoughts. Honey, child, I know they lift their eyes in hell. Okay, God. 
and I know grandma's up there in heaven. Okay, God. I mean, it's good to, uh, you know, good to feel like you know. Uh, and, and some people, if you know they're saved, you, you follow me. But, but here's what he's talking about. And this is what, why this is so important. In winning the Jews, winning them that are under the law, winning them that are without the law, winning them that are weak. Paul says, I want to handle myself in such a manner where I don't get disqualified, where I can no longer win people. Where I can no longer attract people to Christ. Where I can no longer be a magnet for the Lord. You see, the discipline is necessary because when you take a stand, when you take a stand, you have to be disciplined for what's coming as a result of that stand. Satan always pushes back. Glory to God. And so it takes a a degree of discipline so that the devil won't disqualify us from doing the work of the Lord. Bow your head. Father, in Jesus' name, anoint us to be disciplined believers. Disciplined in our prayer life. Disciplined in exercising self-control. Discipline, O oh God. Hallelujah. In, in our willingness to deny ourselves pleasure. Self-sacrificing. Discipline to the point that we are monotonous in certain ways. That we zero in and we focus in and we have the ability to be one-dimensional. Disciplined. When it's Bible study time, we focus on that. When it's prayer time, we lock in on it. Disciplined, Lord. And when it's fasting time, we lock in on these things. Hallelujah. When it's time to train and exercise our gifts, we strenuously do it, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, God, draw us nearer to you. Oh, God, bless us to win souls in these last days. And Father, we pray against being disqualified in the name of Jesus. Give us wisdom in our wrestling match, in our track meet, in our boxing match with ourselves, with our own desires, with the flesh, with the notions of the flesh, with our innate human tendencies and weaknesses. God, give us to be disciplined to the point that we make these minuses assets. That we bring up the areas in our lives that are weak. Hallelujah. Where we've fallen behind. That we strengthen those areas for your glory and for your honor. Now, Lord, we praise you and we give you all of the glory. In Jesus' holy name, thank God. Amen. Give the God of the Bible praises tonight.